walking in at that time. Just teasing. It's good to see you. Good to have you here. Good to be here. And I want to read a scripture from 1 John chapter 4 as we get ready to prepare our hearts for worship this morning. It says, Furthermore, we have seen with our own eyes and now testify that the Father sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Aren't you glad for that? All who declare, this is what I want you to hear, all who declare that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them, and they live in God. We know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. We put our faith, our hope, our trust in him. So stand with us this morning as we worship him. Atmosphere is changing now for the spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around that the spirit of the Lord is here. The atmosphere is changing now For the Spirit of the Lord is here The evidence is all around That the Spirit of the Lord is here Overflowing Thank you. 
the Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around that the Spirit of the Lord is
Just close your eyes for a minute. Quiet all the voices that are inside. Still your heart, still your mind. And can't you hear him tell you that it is well? Can't you feel his heart press into you? Just close your eyes and feel Feel his presence. Take a breath in. Inhale and feel his breath give you life in this moment. And carry that with you today. Let him be the focus. Work with him. Eat with him. Play with him. Hold that breath of life. Feel it ignite the lungs in you, your heart, your organs, your muscles. Feel it in your fingertips. Feel the warmth of his presence and just enjoy it. And the more you focus on it, the more he shows up. He gives us permission to come a little bit closer. Feel how his breath makes the pain disintegrate, the discomfort. If there's anything you're lacking, feel him fill it back up for you. No more loneliness, that ends today. No more doubt, that ends today. No more fear, that ends today. We say that we hunger and we say that we thirst. So God, we just don't wanna sing songs. We don't wanna just sing songs. Come and breathe on us. 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 Let us be still enough to know your presence. Let us be still enough to know your joy. Let us be still enough to know your love. Let us be still enough so that there's no more anxiety. Let us be still enough. Let us slow down. Let us reconnect with the spirit of you. Let us reconnect, reintroduce yourself to us in a new way. Let us reintroduce ourselves to our hearts everything that's in there that's always been in there let it come out today we love on you let us feel your breath breathe on us just breathe on us i 
contentment. Thank you for healing. Thank you for your life. We love you. We honor you. We praise you and we rest in you. You are our rest. In your name we pray. God is good, isn't he? All the time. I have not heard that in a while. Um, this coming, this whole month is in preparation for April the 8th, in which we're having a weekend with Dwayne and Sonny Swilly. It's going to be about all about relationships. And that Saturday morning, it's going to be at 9.30, three sessions. Uh, one for men that talks about how to understand women. One for... <laughs> Who says it's, it's possible? It's going to be possible. Uh, who believes in miracles? And a session for women to how to understand men. That one's probably going to be more difficult than the other one. And then there's one for uh, fifth graders through 12th grade on how to relate to your parents. And then at 11 o'clock, uh, Dwayne Swilly will be sharing that uh, for next up an hour and a half about family and that that's really where they are they have a tremendous ministry to family and uh, especially overseas they go to um, a lot of places especially latin countries matter of fact they spent a whole month in i think it was january or february i can't remember which learning spanish that's how committed they are to uh, what god's called them to do right now so Put that on your connection card. You can sign up for it. Uh, we just need to know how much to prepare for some uh, little refreshments in between the meetings. I had a uh, very humorous moment with God this morning. I uh, was walking out with my umbrella, and it was, of course, raining. And I said, God, you're going to have a hard time getting them to church this morning. It's raining. And they lost an hour of sleep. <laughs> and I just had this spirit voice come up to me and said I'm not going to have a problem getting to church they're not coming to hear me speak it's 
funny when your theology changes how how all of a sudden you kind of relate to things a little different way. So, um, you know, I always want to blame it on God's stuff, you know, his fault. Why God? Why me? Da, da, da. Well, so anyway, we're on relationships this month. Going to be talking about marriage this morning. And I want to say a few things before I get started. You may be here and you've been married 50 years. You may be here and you've been married for the second time. You may be here and you've been married for the third time. I don't know. But uh, my, I just want you to know, people ask me, who am I supposed to be with? You're supposed to be with the one you're with. Was well, your first, second, third marriage, you make covenant and you're supposed to be with that person. And so this is not a message, and I'll probably go for a couple of weeks with this. It's not a message of condemnation by any means. Uh, it's a message of principles. I'm going to talk. I, I said last week I want to uh, preach this month preaching as counseling. And what I want to really want to be this month is your counselor. I want to preach as I counselor would. And so I'm just going to share a lot of principles. There's not going to be so much boom, boom, boom. Uh, but if you get, how I many know if you get one thing this morning that will enhance your relationship, it was worth being here. Just If you just get one thing. I'll never forget back in 1976 on High Falls Road, a very good friend of mine back then, a man by the name of Don Pye. He was a, a Southern Baptist preacher and he came and ran us a revival. He preached on finances one night. And I remember one principle I got from him back in 1976 that I've carried with me for this entire time on finances. And I, I, it still resounds in my heart and my spirit, that one particular principle. I was, uh, so I'm going to share a lot of different things. I'm going to say some things that are, I just want you to grasp a principle. Last week we talked about friendship. And there was one thing in that, that that I got out of that myself more than anything else. And it was when Jesus looked at his disciples and he said, I'm no longer going to call you servants, but I'm going to call you friends. And it hit me. They served him before they became his friend. And really, that's what relationships is all about. If you will serve in relationships, it goes a long, long way. I, um, and I'm not saying this in a boastful way. As a matter of fact, when I tell you why I do it, you'll see it's not a boastful thing. I'm a huge servant in my house. I serve. And the reason I do, because I'm not a very affectionate person. I'm not. I'm not an affectionate person. And so I make up or try to make up for a weakness in my life by serving. And so what I do when I, when the reason I do the things that I do is because I want to serve Barbara. I want to serve my wife. I want her to see me serve her. And uh, I, I take that on. I've taken it on more and more the older I've gotten in more relationships because I believe in serving is what Jesus said. I didn't come to be your master. I came to be your servant. And the greatest of you, of you will be the servant. And, um, so, I, I just, I just want to share my heart with you in these principles today. Um, Keith was sharing in our staff meeting the other day, Penny, about how happy he is with you. And how happy y'all's relationship are. And I know you celebrated 50 years of uh, marriage this past year. And he just was on and on about how great y'all are together. But... There was a time, Penny, I bet you there was a time when you thought maybe differently. Maybe? Yeah. There, <laughs> I won't press it, Keith. There are uh, no perfect marriages. There are just blessed marriages. No perfect marriages. The Apostle Paul was one of the most wisest person maybe ever outside of Christ. When he had his encounter with Jesus, the Bible says that he didn't confer with flesh and blood to get the revelation of Jesus Christ, but rather it said he went off into Arabia, and for three and a half years, he and Christ and God and the Holy Spirit were 
He was understanding the gospel. He was understanding grace. He was understanding mercy. And so he, he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament of that encounter. And yet the Apostle Paul himself said these words, Not that I am perfect, but I strive for it. I'm not perfect, but I'm striving to become it. And that's, that's the position we're in all the time. We're not there, but we're always striving toward it, Right? Always look, striving to be better than we are. And that should be a lifelong thing that we do. It's, it's not something that... Uh, and let me just back up. In, in, whether you've been married a long time or you're in your second marriage, you know, I want you to know some things about divorce. I t I've told people this over and over again over, over the years. There's no such thing as I'm a divorcee. There's, that's not who you are. You're going through a divorce, don't make you not a divorcee. You're still a person. You just happen to have gone through a separation or a divorce. And you probably, in that painful time of your life, you didn't get a divorce. You gave one. You gave it to the person who wanted it. And so that's different than getting something and giving something. So if you look at it in the way, I didn't get it, I gave it. I gave what they wanted to have. So... I like Rock Springs' slogan in their church. It says, the imperfect church for imperfect people. That should be a slogan for every church. The imperfect church for imperfect people. Because none of us are perfect. But we can be blessed. And you're blessed in your marriage if you and God and Jesus and Holy Spirit have a relationship in that home. Because then when you go through difficult times, you have the power of God, the principles of God, the mercies of God, the grace of God to work through those difficult times. I'm, it saddens when I see people who don't have that. It saddens me when I go to funeral homes and I see people who don't have hope. It saddens me when I see people go through trying times and they don't have a support system. It saddens me when I see people who that really could have made it, who really could have gotten through that had they had the right teachings and the right understandings and they had the right support to help them through it because nobody has gone through any lengthy time of marriage without some bumps without some difficult times. you don't go through any kind of relationship without some difficulties anybody ever had a real difficulty with a mom and dad you, you did your, your mom and dad who birthed you and raised you you had problems with them what kind of person are you you ever had a problem with your natural brother or sister? Really? Mm. You ever had a problem with a friend? You ever had a friction with a friend? Of course. You're going to have friction in relationships. There's going to be difficult times you go through, and there are different degrees of it. And according to what it is, is according to the consequences that's that you go through in it but the good news is that no matter what it is you can make it through now i want to give you a principle that's strange for marriage but the book of hebrews is a book about going from shadow to substance or it's about going from here in your understanding to here it's about going from here in your relationship with god and christ to here it's, it's a progressive thing the book of Hebrews, the Greek word is a bear. It means to cross over, to transition, to come over, to overcome. It's a better covenant. It's a new and a living way. And in the book of Hebrews, in our relationship with God, it's either drawing nearer or drawing back. Drawing nearer or drawing back? In our relationship with one another, it is either drawing nearer or drawing back, or it is either progressing or it's regressing. In any relationship. Any relationship is either progressing or regressing. It's either drawing nearer or it's drawing back because it's up to what's happening in that relationship. In Ephesians chapter 5 Starting at verse 21, it says, And further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Say one another. Submit to one another. Then it says, For, this, for wives, this means submit to your husbands as 
to the Lord. Now, if I preach this the way it was preached 25, 30 years ago, all you women would walk out of here. It would all, it'd be a men's conference this morning. You would just walk out because it was taught that you were to submit in every area of your life. To, he is the head of the family. Anybody ever heard that one? He is the head of the family, and you better submit to him. Submit to his authority. Submit to, and that's not what the word submit means. It means to just give yourself wholly to your husband as you would to the Lord. And what that means is we should do that with everybody. In every degree of relationship, I should give myself to you as unto the Lord. How would I give myself to the Lord in that situation? It's how I would give myself and should give myself to you. It says, for a husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. And we'll talk about that in a moment. He is the savior of his body, the church, as the church submits to Christ. So you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. Husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean. He washed her by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands, you know, he, boy, he says very little about wives, but he is, he's on a rampage about husbands. I said, wives, you ought to be with me. My gosh, women. <laughs> he says very little about wives, but buddy, he goes on a rampage about husbands. He says, wives, you just do this. Husbands, you got to do, 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 do. You got to do a lot more than what I'm, I'm asking of her. I'm asking of you more. There's a principle there. In the same way, husbands ought to lo love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church, as we are members of the body. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother, is joined to his wife, and the two are united in one. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. He basically says several things. You need to sanctify your wife by your words. The words that you speak over her is sanctifying her and making her holy. And wives, you should respect your husbands because the biggest thing that men desire, I know what sometimes you think the biggest thing we desire is really not the biggest thing we desire. Even though it's a big thing that we desire, it's not the biggest thing that we desire. It's respect. I'm, hey, I'm not going to be candid up here, okay? We're big boys and big girls, aren't we? You know, the problem with people today is they're not taught from the right place they ought to be taught from. This book covers it all. This book covers it all. It, 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 it don't just cover this over here. It covers it all. He'll, he'll give you a birds and bees talk over and over in this book if you'll let him. He'll tell you about how to have relationships anyway. So, he says that relationship is based upon mutual respect and mutual love and mutual concern. But I want you to say, and mutual servanthood to one another. And if you want to know what a relationship is and how relationships are really going to thrive, be a servant. Serve them. Okay. That's a whole, I could stay on that. How many know you could stay on this another hour? That's just the introduction. Now I want to talk about how it all started. And, and that could be a whole message, but that's not the whole message. That's just the middle part. And then I'm going to end with the Ten Commandments and how that has an effect on our marriage. But it all started back in Genesis chapter 2. And we don't have scriptures. Found out this morning our, he's sick. Jason is and couldn't be here. But <clears throat> the Lord God said... It's not good for the man to be alone. I'll make him a helper. Who, let, me, well, let me say something back up a minute. It, bad teaching that 
until I get married, I'm not complete. Bad teaching. You are complete in Christ. If that were the case, Jesus was not complete. Because Jesus never got married. So if, it's, if you've got to have a wife or you've got to have a husband to be complete, that's, that's false teaching. No, you're complete in who you are. You're a whole person in who you are. And if you go into a marriage hoping they're going to complete you, you're going to be highly disappointed. If you go into a marriage hoping they're going to, going to meet all of your needs, you're going to be highly disappointed. If you go into a marriage thinking that this is going to solve all the problems of your life, you <laughs> that's funny. That's hilarious. No, no. No, 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 no. Matter of fact, the Apostle Paul said, I want to save you from some trouble. If you want trouble, get married. I'm paraphrasing it, but read it. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, that's what he said. I just want to warn you that if when you're by yourself, you only have to please God. But when you get married, you got to please God and somebody else. It's not easy, is it, David? Oh, it's not an easy thing. It's not easy, but it's worth it. You know, I could say to Keith today, aren't you glad you stuck it out? Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad you stuck it out? Man, I'm so glad I stuck it out. I'm so glad Barbara stuck it out with me. When I think about my family, my grandkids, when I think about the unit, oh, thank God. Thank God. Or better, I thank her. She stuck it out. She should thank me. I stuck it out. Be grateful and thankful. Let me tell you something about another little misnomer that I hear people say something. Well, God restored my marriage. No, he didn't. You restored your marriage. Through his principles, but you did it. Because I've heard people say that, and I see people over here and say, well, God didn't restore mine. No, he didn't restore theirs either. God's not, he didn't come down and do all this work. He gives you the tools and gives you the principles and gives you the understanding to, to work through things. You're the one that's going to carry it through. You're the one who's going to remain. You're the one who's going to stick it out. You're the one who's going to, <laughs> you're the one who's going to do it. And so he says he needs a helper, not someone to complete him, just somebody to help him. That word helper is the same word that Jesus used of the Holy Spirit when he said he will send us the Holy Spirit who will be our paraclete, one called alongside us to help. And so what happens is in a marriage, a man and a woman come together and they help each other through life. Amen. Aren't you glad of that? He says, it's not good for him to be alone. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the ground and of the sky. He brought them to man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one. <laughs> he, he was smart. I mean, don't a hippopotamus look like a hippopotamus? <laughs> don't a rabbit look like a rabbit? Well, you wouldn't have that if it hadn't been for Adam. He, he's, he looks like a giraffe. And now we all go, that's a giraffe. Oh, that looks like a rabbit. That, that, yep, that's exactly what a rabbit looks like. And so he's naming all these animals. And then it says, he gave all these names to the livestock, all the birds of the sky, all the wild animals, but there was still no helper just right for him. Say amen, men. Aren't you glad? Aren't you? Not, not amen. That's so let it be. Let me back up. Say hallelujah. <laughs> I am glad that he did not find a helpmate in the animal kingdom, aren't you? I am so glad that Adam didn't decide, oh yeah, I think I could spend my life with that giraffe. Thank God. Thank, thank God he didn't go, oh, I like that hippo. I think, you know, we could really get along. Thank God he did not. I'm, you know, you say, you're trying to be humorous. No, I'm just trying to read the Bible just the way the Bible's read. I'm just reading the Bible. And he, and he said, you know, I don't find anybody. So the Lord God caused a man to fall into a deep sleep. And while the man slept, the Lord God took one of his ribs, closed up the opening, just like Jesus on the cross. He pierced his side, and out of his side came the church. Out of his side came the bride. Out of his side, Adam's side, came the bride. And I say sometimes in, 
and weddings, she was not taken out of his head to dominate or to be over him, neither from under his feet to be trampled upon by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, near his heart to be loved by him and be protected by him. Out of his side. And he closed it up and he made a woman and he brought it to man. At last, the man exclaimed this one is bone from my bone flesh from my flesh she shall be called woman because she was taken from man wow he woke up and that's what happened to you one day guys you you know how it was when you fell in love you just you was dreaming you just you went to sleep next thing you knew you woke up my whoa Adam goes to sleep, and after looking at all the animals, he wakes up, and there's a naked woman. He goes, whoa, man, whoa, man. And he goes, is that what you want to call her? <laughs> whoa, man, that's how you got woman. Okay. <laughs> this explains, I told you we're going to be candid. This explains why, listen, why a man leaves his father and mother, is joined to his wife, the two are united in one, the man and wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. Four things, four Ps, and then I'm going to close it out. Number one, priority. If you keep your mate as your priority, it says he leaves his mother and father and he cleaves to his wife. There, and let me give you a principle about priority, husband and wife. I learned this many, many years ago. I don't even know where I got it from. It's called the 80-20. If you're looking for them for you to be their priority 100% of the time, it's not going to happen. Nobody's perfect. If, it's 80, if you get 80%, thank God you got 80%. You know, you know, it's sad that most marriages, most marriages, you get 80% of it. But you know what happens? We focus on the 20% you don't get, and you make a big deal out of 20. When 80% of the time, they, they're good. they just good. Don't focus on the 20% that you're not getting. Focus on the 80% that you are getting. It will make a difference. And if you want to you get what you once had, do what you once did. Second P, they're your priority. He says, and they were joined. Joined means to cling, to adhere, to catch by pursuit. You pursue them. Don't stop pursuing one another. Pursue them. Pursue them with conversation, with thoughtfulness, with affection, with protection. Pursue them with admiration, with reassurance, with support. Pursue them. Pursue. pursue. That's what happens in a lot of marriages, a lot of relationships. We stop pursuing one another. And then he said, and they were united. That means all together. They're partners. It's a partnership. Marriage is a covenant, not a contract. Difference. A contract's based on mutual distrust. A covenant's based on mutual trust. And a covenant is based on me making covenant with you. Okay? No matter what you do. Christ God made the first covenant with Abraham. He put Abraham asleep. And they, in, in other words, God said, Abraham, this covenant's one-sided. I'm going to do my part whether you do your part or not. Oh, I'm going to do my part whether you do your part or not. That's, that's covenant. It's God's covenant with us. He says, I was faithful when you were unfaithful. It's not based upon, it's not a contract. You shake hands. You know, when do, we do it every time we have a ceremony. The man makes a, a vow to his wife and she makes a vow. He, he, I never heard a vow like this. Barbara, I vow as long as you do this, this, and this, I will do this, this, and this. There is no vows I've ever seen in marriage ceremonies. It's a one-sided that I, I commit myself to you. I will love you. I will honor you. I will respect you. Right? Not if. That's amazing, though. After we get married, the if comes in. It's amazing. After established, the if, it has nothing to do with the if. 
has to do with, I'm making a covenant to you. Period. You know, I didn't say it last week on friendships, but I've got a lot of friendships. I carry friendship. It doesn't matter to me if you call me or not. I'm calling you. It has nothing to do. If you're going to base all your relationships on give and take, you're going to be hurting in life. But if you base your relationships not on you do this and I'll do this, just pay, what are you going to do? You want to be a friend? Be a friend. You want to be loving? Be loving. You want to be kind? Be kind. You want to do it? Do that. But don't, don't go around expecting everybody else to do it. I'm sorry. It's my, it's my soapbox that I could stand on for hours and talk about because it bothers me when people always relegate their relationships based upon what somebody else is going to do. They're to base it upon what you're going to do. If you want it, do it. If you want it, be it. That's my daddy moment. Then it was pure. They were naked and not ashamed. But I want to close with this. Keep them as your priority. Pursue them. You're in partnership and keep it pure. In Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 1, God's talking to Israel. And he says this to Israel, I betroth you, in Amplified Translation says, I betroth you, I ask you to marry me, how you want to put it. I betroth you in Egypt. I married you at Mount Sinai. I betroth you in Egypt. I ask you to come out of Egypt and follow me. And he says, I remember your love of your devotion as a youth. I remember how loving you were to me. But Jeremiah, who became the weeping prophet, who wept over Jerusalem because Jerusalem had lost her love, had fallen back from following their lover with all their heart. And he wept. He's, he spent a whole book called Lamentations, lamenting, crying over Jerusalem, cry, crying over Israel. He says, God, this is what God says about his covenant. I will establish it. I'll give you a token of it. And it's everlasting. And no matter what you do, I'm going to do my part. There's three things you can do with covenant. Three things. You can break it. You can transgress it. Or you can abandon it. I didn't know that there was such a difference in the three. You break covenant by just casting off the restraint. You just cast it off. You, that you, know, what, you know what you should do. And you just cast it off and you just don't do it. You transgress covenant it's when you alter it in other words the serpent said to adam god said you can't even touch the tree no he didn't he said you can't eat it he wanted to alter it make it more than it was We want to make marriage more than it is. We want to make it more difficult than it is. We want to expect more than you ought to expect. Okay? But here's another way you alter it. Now, I like the 80-20. But that 80-20 is for me and you. But the 80-20 can be used in a bad way. I do all of this. So... Maybe I don't do this. Or I make excuses because, because I'm so good at all of this. Well, why are you picking on this? Well, this may be a big, huge thing. And so you can alter the covenant by adding more to it than ought to be or taking from it what ought not ought to be. In Revelation, it says, woe is the person who takes from this prophecy or adds to this prophecy. And see, that's what happens with the word. Sometimes we add to it. Sometimes we take from it. Both are equally wrong. So, we can abandon it. We can just leave it. We can just have no guidelines at all in our relationship. Give me liberty 
to share this with you this morning. Because I've never read this anywhere. I never used it anywhere. But I believe the Ten Commandments are a great way to keep a relationship. I have no other gods before me. I'm the, you've, you're my number one priority. Try to keep that. You're my, you're my priority. No idols. Don't have an idol. <laughs> I played softball years ago. And man, we played every weekend tournaments. Well, I saw divorces over softball. Because the woman wanted her husband there on the weekend and he wanted to play softball. And he made a softball an idol and it hurt the relationship. Yeah. Fishing. I love fishing. But I guarantee if I go fishing every single day, it ain't going to work. Watch the I, uh, women. I really, I, I want to come up with a few idols. I don't know. Y'all come up with your own. I just ain't going there. Um, don't take my name in vain. Don't call me something I'm not. Don't call her something she's not or him something he's not. I guarantee you when you were courting, you never called her a name. You never said you are such and such. or he, You never said to him, you're su-. you know, you never did that. Situations and circumstances don't make us that. We're created in God's likeness and in God's image. Always call your mate who they are. They are in the image of God. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Kind of struggle with that one. I could go, you know, have a day a week to date or whatever you want to do. But I, I take it from the standpoint, keep it holy Ephesians, Paul said that Jesus kept us holy, sanctified us by the word he spoke over us. Keep your mate holy by the words you speak over them. Say good words over them and you'll keep it holy. Honor your mother and father all the days of your life. Man, some of the biggest fights parent, husband and wife can get in is over the kids. Honor them as a mother. Honor them as a father. Honor them. Don't pit one against the other. Be like me going up to Bessie and saying, I'm going to tell you something about your mama. She is just driving me crazy. (laughs) Have you ever done that, Beard? Yes, I have. (laughs) I'm not perfect. I'm blessed. Yes, I have. Your mama is driving me crazy. Well, what's she going to do? Talking about her mama. I know Barbara's never <laughs> said, your daddy is about to drive me crazy. She never said that, has she? <laughs> Not in the past week. <laughs> Honor them. Don't kill. Don't kill their dreams, their visions. Don't kill them. You've ever killed Barbara's dream? Yeah. I've said, you've got to be crazy. Just kill the dream. Don't kill the dreams. No matter how big it is. Barbara still tells me she's going to have a million dollar home on the beach one day. I'm going, you're crazy. It's going to be crazy one day when she has one. You never know. Don't commit adultery. Don't fornicate. Be faithful. Let me explain the difference. The Pharisees came to Christ one time and said, Can a man divorce his wife for just any reason, any cause? And Jesus says, No. It wasn't that way from the beginning. From the beginning, I made them one. Man left his mother and the father. They became one. were joined together. He said, A man is not to divorce his wife. Saving for the cause of fornication. If she's unfaithful, she has a right to divorce. Adultery is divorcing somebody and marrying another. And there's a misunderstanding, and it's okay. People define it as the same thing. But adultery is not being unfaithful. Being unfaithful is fornication. As long as the marriage remains, you haven't committed adultery. Adultery, if you divorce your wife, 
for any other reason that she's unfaithful and you marry somebody else, you've committed adultery and you've caused that person to commit adultery. Fornication comes from the Greek word porneia, And porneia is an ongoing problem that you have. You can, there's three reasons you could be married to another person. Number one, if you're married to a person, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and they're an unbeliever. And they don't have the same faith you do. And if they decide to leave, let them leave. You're not bound to them any longer. The Bible says if you, your husband or wife dies, you're not bound to them any longer. Or if they commit fornication and they break the covenant, you, have the, you can. You don't have to, but you can. But everything can be redeemed by forgiveness and love. But fornication is really porneia. It's an ongoing problem. It's, some, it's like somebody who slipped up sometime. It's, an own, it's a, a lifestyle that you're living. Like, I don't expect you to live in that. Don't do it. And don't, and not a person here. Look, I'm going to tell you right now. Not a person here. You think you can't do that. You don't know what you're saying. There's not one person here who could not be caught up in any moment, in any time, in a relationship you ought not be caught up in. Not a person here this morning. And it's like, you say, how did this happen? Like Moses came down, there's a golden calf. And Moses said, how did this happen? Aaron said, Aaron, I don't know. They kept bringing gold, they kept bringing silver, and they kept bringing all of this, and out came this calf. No, you took it, you molded it, you, you, you melted it in fire, you put it together, and, and this is what happened. You don't didn't expect it. Can I have a cup of coffee with you? Oh, sure. No big deal. Let's have a cup of coffee. No big deal. Huge deal. That's a little melting of the... A little melting of it. Fashion. It don't just happen. It's, things happen. But no matter what happens, God can mend it all. And so God... Moses didn't come down and say, okay... You've committed this. You've done this. I'm divorcing you. Matter of fact, Moses got mad and slammed the commandments down and broke them. And God got on to him for that. You I ain't breaking covenant over this. Oh, boy. That's good stuff. <laughs> Don't steal. Don't steal their joy. Don't steal the time you should spend with one another. Don't steal that. Uh, this one, I didn't think I had anything, and then I really meditated about it. It says, don't bear false witness against your neighbor. And I thought, Joe, what does that have to do with me and Barbara? It's because if I start talking about my neighbor and bringing all that negativity into our family, it's going gonna, it's gonna to devastate our relationship. Don't bring negativity into your relationship. Don't talk about other people. It's just hurting you. You're just, you're just saying, come on in, negativity. Come on in, criticism. Come on in. And, and it's bothering that relationship. Remember when you were dating? You man, All you cared about was you and them. Man, I could just let on the phone. All we talked about was one another. Oh, man. That was all. My man, I remember hanging the phone up. My daddy come by and said, "Oh, you just get you. I never. You are such and such." I said, "I know." <laughs> this one's pretty simple. Don't covet anything your neighbor's got. Be happy with what you got. Man, what? <laughs> You see, see the commercials, and man, they so violate the marriage covenant. We like look like me, Barbara, looking, said, "Man, you see the neighbor's new new car? Why can't we get a new car? Because we ain't got money to get a new car. <laughs> Why ain't we got the money to get a new car? Because you spend it all on fishing. <laughs> and then, <laughs> then the next thing you know, you just got a big old argument over something that you never argued about. Be content with what you got." Amen? It's good stuff. It's a lot of principles. I hope you got one thing. If you just got one thing, and you can apply it to your life, 
and make a better relationship. It's worth it. Just get one, one thing. Because it's not like it used to be. Ain't like it used to be. 50, 65% of men by the age of 40 commit adultery, fornication. 65%. 45% of women before 40. 3% of them end in marriage because they don't always, they hardly ever end in marriage. They just end marriages. We don't live in a time where my daddy walked in my trailer years ago and said, come on, let's go see your brother. I said, why? He said, he thinks he's leaving his family. I said, well, if he thinks he's leaving his family, maybe he's leaving his family. He said, no, he thinks he's leaving his family. So he walked in at his house Daddy says, come back to the bedroom, Eddie. Me and Daddy and Eddie go back to the bedroom. Come here, Ron, stand a minute. Daddy closes the door. I'm right here. Daddy's right here. He grabs Eddie, pushes him up against the door, says, you're not leaving your family. You understand? You understand? Eddie says, yeah, I understand. Okay. (laughs) He he turned around to me and says, he says, all right, we can go now. And I'm sitting there going... (laughs) Did, but then when we walked out, I said, yeah, we mean it too. <laughs> it's amazing how bold you get after it's all over. Yeah, buddy. You hear us? <laughs> no, I'm shaking like a leaf inside, but outside I'm going, yes, sir, we saved that marriage. <laughs> Don't try that now. You're probably going to get hit upside the head. Those days are over. Your mom and your daddy's not going to save it. You're the only one that's going to save it. You're the only one. It's up to you. It's up to me to walk it out. Amen? So, be a servant. Be a servant. Serve them. I wasn't a servant in our first 20 years. I wasn't. And I wasn't that affectionate either. I turned it around. I sighed, like, don't do that very well. And I ain't making excuses. I should do that. I, I don't. That's not, that, it's not, it's not who I am. I'm not saying that's not who I am. It's just something, that's a shortcoming in my life. I need to work on, okay? I know you don't have any. <laughs> I know you're perfect. You don't have any. But I make up with serving. You can ask my family. I serve. I serve them. Because... That's the greatest thing that you can do. My daughter calls me at any time. Can, before she even says, can you? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Sure. I want to. Because it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And so I'm not going to stand up here and give you this big thing. I'm such a good this or good that. I got all kind of faults. All kind of faults. I make up a lot of them. We're doing one thing really well. And you can make up a lot of bad stuff by just doing one thing really, really well. And I want to commend a lot of you. I've been married for a long time. Joe and Linda. I mean, many of you here, Calvin and Susan. Aren't you glad you stuck it out, Calvin? Susan, aren't you glad you stuck it out with that guy? Aren't you glad when you see your... Your family, aren't you glad? Aren't you glad, Ken, you stuck it out? Oh, Morgan, aren't you glad you stuck it out? <laughs> Let me really get to the, to the right point. But some of you went through divorce, and you're, and you're in great marriages. I see Joy and Kitty, and I just, that they're such a great, great marriage. I mean, it can't be. All these principles is for our lives all the time. And um, I, just, I just want to commend all of you all of you for being who you are but let's all get better okay all right i'm gonna sometimes the best way to do it is do it publicly so i'm gonna i'm gonna try to be more affectionate all right okay you can kind of hold me to it i'm gonna try to be more affectionate and um i bet that works out pretty good for me don't you will be a reason for that. Let's stand together. And um, <clears throat> I 
We're going to have a sacrament of healing. And I'm going to, boy, let me really encourage you in this right now because last week I gave an altar call and it was about forgiving. And it wasn't about forgiving the big stuff. It was about forgiving things that you don't think is a big thing. See, the Bible says it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. Most marriages, they, they go through big stuff. They make it through the big stuff. It's the little foxes that spoil the vine. And uh, I was talking to Lynn and uh, um, Langston the other, about a month ago. And I kind of just mentioned it too. And I said, Lynn, we're in a great time of healing. Healing of souls. I mean, I just see good things happening quickly. And we've communicated over the last month. And both of us, man, there's such rapid good stuff happening. And the Bible says, in one place says, and the power of the Lord was present to heal. And there's a story about a man by the waters. And there's a, it was a thing that the angels supposedly troubled the water. And the first who get into the water was healed. But I really believe that there's principles of Scripture. I believe that we are in a time of the troubling of the waters. Where there's a good troubling of the waters. Where healing is just rampant. It's spirit, soul, and body. And so you're here today. And uh, somebody came up to me last week after the service and caught me going down the aisle and said, God, I should have been, I should have come down there. I said, well, you can handle it right here. But maybe you said last week, you know, I should have come down. I didn't come down last week. Well, you got a chance this week to do it too. But anything in your spirit, your soul, body, you just need God to touch you. Just come and stand across the front and let some elders come and just pray over you and believe God to let you see things that need to change in your life and, and you'll know what it is and it will happen. And good, good things, good things are on the horizon. Good things are happening. Things, you know, it's just neat what's happening. God, we thank you. We sanctify this time by the word and by prayer. And we know this oil is symbolic of your Holy Spirit. And that, Lord, we just submit ourselves to you and the Lord. And we thank you, God, for healing. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives. We thank you for it. We thank you for it, Lord. We thank you for it, Lord. Thank you for it, Lord. We seal it in his heart and soul. We seal it in his heart and soul.
tell you a quick thing that happened with my mom. And uh, some of you know a little bit about it, but you don't know the real extent of it. But mother kept saying before she passed away, it's not my time. It's not time yet. God's got something else for me to do. It ain't time. It ain't time. And um, so she told Barbara what she needed. Barbara called me on the phone and said, you call your brother and you get him out here now. And that's why I honored Barbara the way I did at the funeral because she rose up during our time and became the real strength of our family and walked us through that situation. <clears throat> she said, Barbara said, your mother's got to know that you and your brother love each other. And y'all going to be spend time together. She's got to know that. And uh, I didn't think it's a big deal. Really didn't. I said, well, well, I'll go and make that okay with mom. But we got there, and Eddie was on one side of the bed, and I was on the other. And she reached up, and she grabbed us and just pulled us down and held us. And says, I got to know you love each other. I got to know. I got to know you're going to spend time with each other. And... Uh, so we just loved on her and just made a commitment to her. We love each other, Mother. We're going to spend time with each other. And it was like she was all good. Just lifted from her. And she looked at us both and she said, I can go now. I can go now. See what relationships mean? They mean everything. They mean everything. Hear this woman suffering but holding on to one thing that's a relationship that she just got to know that she got to know got to know that all is well and I, I wouldn't give a and my, my relationship our relationship has been totally different since then totally different I even took him fishing <laughs> and I told him I said you set the record at the pond today Eddie he, I said, he said really I said yeah you caught the smallest bass and the smallest brim I've ever seen caught at this point. <laughs> God bless you. You may be seated. As our ushers are coming and receiving our morning's tithes and offerings and alms, a lot of important information in your bulletin. If you are a guy and you want to eat breakfast Tuesday morning at 7, we have a men, we're hosting a men's prayer breakfast. It's a community prayer breakfast. And once a year we host that, so that's at 7 o'clock on Tuesday morning, if you want to do that. But this Wednesday night is at the table, and it is going to be our last at the table, the third Wednesday uh, until fall. And uh, you don't want to miss it. It's going to be a great meal. It's only $5. Uh, EDO Kitchen will be producing uh, pork tenderloin and wild rice and fresh green beans and salad. So uh, you, today is your deadline to sign up for that. The meal is at 6, and, uh, and then we will have the discussion groups that will be taking place that evening. And there's lots of discussion groups that will be going on, so that is this week. Today is also, if you are interested in water baptism for next Sunday, we have two that will be water baptized. If you have interest, you need to make sure you see me today. Otherwise, we'll do it another time, but, uh, and we'll give you more information on that. Let's pray and let's bless this offering. Father, Lord, we thank you that we can come to your house. We can give and receive or be filled. Lord, we can take our first fruits, Father, Lord, and allow them to be used for the furtherment of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, we ask you to bless that. Amen. If you would stand and let's worship.
everybody have a beautiful week.